Thank you all. I'm very honored to speak here tonight. And the story today starts with a noise. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk to you about grassroots photojournalism and also about visual literacy. And I'm going to talk about that in the backdrop of Kachin State. And hopefully some of you will understand some things about Kachin State in the process as well. Uh, so the story starts when I got a grant from the Pulitzer Center to go to uh, the Kachin Independence Organization controlled area in Kachin State. And I went there for one month and I found a lot of very amazing things happening there. And also before I went, I tried to do some research on the situation and I found almost nothing written for over a decade about the situation there. And so I was very fascinated to go, and my job uh, for the Pulitzer Center was to report about what was happening. This one's good. Okay. Uh, okay. So I found also uh, a very amazing culture there that is not very well known and not really connected with. Uh, Burma or any of the places around there. It's much more closer to the uh, Tibetan and they live in the high elevation and they actually don't have words in their language for things you find in low elevations such as rice paddies and things. So it's a very amazing uh, culture and situation. There was also a ceasefire at the time that had been signed 17 years ago and uh, while I was there, it became very obvious to me that the ceasefire was very fragile and was about to break. And I spent five years going regularly to Kachin State, and the ceasefire did break while I was there. And today there's daily fighting, and there's 90,000 new refugees. Uh, who here knows where Kachin State is on the map? We, we're all good uh, lifetime residents of Southeast Asia, right, and all concerned where's 90,000 new refugees on our border. Anyone? Yes? Okay. There's Kachin State. Okay, it's high up in the Himalaya, and there's a lot of resources there. There's jade, timber, uh, rare earth minerals, uh, and a lot of hydropower potential, which is a big thing right now. I also found a lot of uh, human rights abuses there. Uh, this is one house, actually a whole village that was burned as the government army was retreating. And uh, after the fighting did break out, the international news did start to pay some attention to what was happening, but they were mostly just reporting on the most acute things that were happening, such as the fighting and the refugees. But still today, it's very difficult to find information about really the causes of the why the ceasefire broke and why there are refugees. And but 90,000 is a big number and it's a statistic. So I want to share with you a photo and a story of three of those refugees. Uh, I'm also making a feature length film now in Kachin State. And I asked for volunteers at one of the camps to people to tell their story. So this woman kindly volunteered. But when we went to her hut and when I turned on the video camera, her whole body was frozen and she couldn't talk. And we sat there in uncomfortable silence for a while and then I turned off the camera and then I talked to her neighbor and asked what had happened. And she said that the government army had just shot her husband while he was farming in front of her and her kids. And she, was, she wanted to tell her story but she couldn't. And this is one of the many, many sad stories you can find in Kachin State today. But they're not all sad stories that's happening there. The Kachin people are also very proactive and uh, doing a lot of things to make a better future for themselves. And the Kachin Independence Organization also has a really uh, established state there with a lot of services. This is free health care that's provided in the Liza Hospital. And this is a, it's very well-trained doctors, very good facilities, and it's free to the patients. And this is an appendicitis to a 14-year-old girl. These are amazing things really to provide anywhere in the region, but especially considering this area is 
uh, blocked by sanctions, blocked from aid, and, uh, and not very well known about. They also have a, a really good public education system. And this is a, an example of them teaching their native language and their native history. Actually, Kachin State had a very high level of education in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And after 1961, after the military coup, the federal government took over the education system there. And they stopped allowing them to use their local language. They stopped allowing to teach uh, the local history. And they also kicked out all the foreign teachers. So still today, the level of education in most of Kachin State has gone down very bad. Uh, and they also have uh, a lot of nice infrastructure. Like they have a, one of the only reliable sources of power in Burma. And it's provided by the Kachin Independence Organization. And even today, the government and the Burmese army are buying power from the rebels because their state is really quite well organized. So I saw these things and I saw that it was a big story and I wasn't going to be able to cover it all myself. And also, something about me is my degree is not in journalism. My degree is in peace studies. And many people laugh when they say, I have a degree in peace studies. They say, oh, what is that? And even if they've heard of it, they say, well, what do you do with that? Well, the answer is you often make up your own path. And this is uh, the story of my path that I made up and how I wanted to be active with peace and photography. So I started teaching photography to the local youth there to really get them to engage with the things that are happening around them and then to be able to share that with a larger audience. And in the beginning, the students were already doing very good work in the workshops. But my problem was after the workshops, it was uh, not easy to get them to follow up and to really, I didn't just want a few photos. I wanted a, a group of people that were really hungry to make images and to share them with the world. So I realized I needed more than one-time workshops. So I started a foundation called Documentary Arts Asia. And with that, even just a name and a logo, then the students started to take the workshops more seriously. And they felt like this workshop is something bigger than a one-time event. It's bigger than themselves. It's something large that they want to help out with. And I promised them a gallery to show their work. I promised them grants when they found interesting projects to shoot. I promised them more workshops on different topics and uh, a lot of other things. So then after that, then the students started producing much better work. And this is one example that I just love. And I was teaching a class and I saw this in, in one of the many images. And I immediately stood up and I said, who took this photo? And the students were a bit shy because I was like very, said it very loud. And finally, one, teach, uh, one student said, teacher, I took this photo. And I went over and immediately gave him a big congratulations. Say, I love this photo because it shows the reality of life on the front line in a way that's very difficult for an outsider to show. He's there totally unguarded, smoking a cigarette, looking at his girlfriend. The guy in the back is cleaning a rifle. And I think it says something a, a lot about the, just the real life of people there. And it's something that's not easy, even for me working there for five years as a photographer, to capture. So I asked him if he had other images that I could see. And sure enough, he had a lot of images that showed this, this beautiful intimacy with the subjects. Um, because he speaks the language, he grew up there, many of them are his friends. And I was so encouraged by what he was doing that I left my camera with him because he had no camera to use at all. And a few days later, I got a call from uh, New York City from the Eugene Smith Memorial Fund. And they said I had won one of their three grants that they give every year. And this was very exciting for me because I had promised my students a gallery and many things, but I didn't really know how I was going to get it to them. Um, but so this grant came through, and then uh, I was able to, to take all these things to the next level. So I went back immediately from New York City, and this is me teaching uh, an advanced workshop. And the students' faces are blanked out because still today in Kachin State, uh, they consider it very unsafe to be known as a photojournalist. Uh, but I went back and I taught intermediate, advanced classes, flash classes, video classes, and even teacher training classes. And as soon as I finished one or two months of workshops, then I went back to Chiang Mai, where Documentary Arts Asia is centered. 
and I found a space and opened up this gallery. And we had a very well, uh, amazing support from the very beginning. An hour after our doors opened, there was 300 people there. And um, it's been a really good turnout ever since. And it really shows that there's an interest and a need for, for these kind of... Uh, we, show, we have exhibitions that change every month. We have films. We have speakers. We have a lot of things. And the momentum just kept building as we were making connections and people were hearing about us. And then after six months, uh, the Foundry Photojournalism Workshops, which brings 17 of the top photojournalists in the world to come teach uh, without a salary someplace in the world. And this year, that was Chiang Mai. And we were really lucky to have all these amazing teachers here. It also brought in 150 students. Uh, many of them came for free or very affordable prices. And last but not least, we also have a festival, which is coming up for the second time in February in Chiang Mai. It's called the Chiang Mai Documentary Arts Festival because we're mixing documentary photography with documentary film. And we have a lot of world-class exhibitions and speakers, portfolio reviews, uh, a lot of things. So I hope maybe I'll see some of you there. And meanwhile, while I was doing all this, Kun Lee was still finding uh, a way to take photos, even though he still didn't own a camera. He was just borrowing them from journalists as they passed through and trying to find some of his friends. And, and he's just producing even more and more amazing images all the time. This is a whole village that's fleeing frontline fighting, coming to one of the refugee camps. And this is the kind of thing that, like, at the time I started documenting in Kachin State, there were 700 full-time photojournalists working in Iraq and zero in Kachin State. And I was like the closest thing that people considered full time, but I was only there for one, two, uh, at most six months a year. So there's many amazing things happening like this that now I feel happy that my students are there capturing these moments that I can't and that a lot of the international media doesn't have time or money to do. And they also have a way of capturing these really fun uh, moments that sometimes the international media, when they come in, they just kind of focus on the, the most sad story and I think these images are important to see also. They are refugees. They have lost their home. They have no school. But they have these fun moments where they swim. And, and I love that, that my students are very good at capturing the, the full picture of what's happening there. Also, uh, I have a series of grants, very small, just $100 when the students have an idea they want to shoot. But this was taken when one of my students said, I want to do a project just about the kids in the refugee camps. And he wrote in his proposal that right now these refugee kids are more interesting to me than my own girlfriend. So I thought, well, that's going to be a really good that's going to be a really good project. So I definitely gave him a hundred dollars, and he came up with amazing work. And he still continues to shoot today. And it and these are very recent images, and it's really uh, great for me to see that. I've succeeded in not just making some one-time one workshop and a few images, but in creating a group of people that are really hungry to be engaged in telling their own story with, with uh, photos and video. Just a few more images. And then uh, it's not just also Kun Lee, although he has done a lot of really amazing things. Here's five other images from uh, five other photographers who have gone through the advanced training with me. And next I want to share with you a fun short video that's a time lapse of putting up Kun Lee's exhibition at our gallery in Chiang Mai. Sound. Okay, 
So you can see um, we get a quite good turnout for our events, and there was actually more than 100 people that wouldn't fit in the frame, and then another 100 people outside that couldn't even fit in our gallery. Um, so, and it's not just our gallery that Kun Lee has been able to exhibit in. This is the Foreign Correspondence Club of Thailand, just down the street. And it's one of the best uh, photo galleries in Asia. And Kun Lee was able to exhibit there one year after starting to use a camera. And his work has also been used by the US campaign for Burma and many other places. And now Kun Lee is teaching, as well as uh, the other advanced students. And it's really rewarding to see that, and that the cycle is completing itself and really, that uh, my main job is I'm trying to work myself out of a job. So when he starts to teach in his native language and teach in Burmese, then that's uh, less work I have to do and more that they can do themselves. And really rewarding to see. So I'm really excited to see the next generation of what his students will be doing. So we have two missions at Documentary Arts Asia. One you've heard about already is supporting documentary artists in Asia. The other is advancing visual literacy. So many people, um, this is my neighbor, Nong Bat. He comes in a gallery every day. Many people like him, uh, kids and adults as well, are bombarded with hundreds, if not thousands, or tens of thousands of images a day. And what I think is really interesting is right now, there's schools and society and families are not really teaching enough how to read these images and interpret them and how they affect you. Your kids spend so long in, to learn how to read words, but if you think about where the, our information comes from today, so much of it is visual from images. And uh, I hope in 10 years the bot will be the next director of Documentary Arts Asia. Uh, and there are people that are taking this uh, visual literacy seriously, even if they're not engaged in image making, there's a lot of schools that are bringing their students to our gallery to look at our exhibitions, look at our photo books, and just really be engaged uh, with images much more. We're also going out into the community and going out into universities and teaching, uh, teaching one, photography skills and video skills, but also just teaching about visual literacy and getting a lot more people involved and in, in taking this seriously. And this is one of our uh, advisors, and he's giving a talk about his very important work in uh, Rakhine State about the Rohingyas. And when we have events like this, we get a lot of people down from all ages. And the last thing I want to say is visual literacy is not only something that should be taken more seriously in the school system when people are uh, getting an education, but I think everyone should think of it more as like lifelong learning. No matter how old you are, you're still being bombarded with thousands of images a day, and we should think about how those are affecting you in the world. And last is our animated logo for Documentary Arts Asia. Thank you very much. <laughs>